Seismic PE prep number 13 coming at you. Let's get right into it. The plan view of a one-story office building shown is underlain with stiff soil. Use a value of 1.6 for S sub S. The building has a wood structural panel roof diaphragm and shear walls. The roof drag struts are continuous. The roof dead load is 20 PSF. The wall dead load, 16 PSF. And the building is 14 feet tall. Use the simplified design procedure given in the ASCE 7 slash SEI uh, 7, section 1214. For north-south loading, the roof shear force at line B is most nearly what? All right, so for today's example, let's first jot down the information that was provided to us. A flexible diaphragm, which means that we know the load distribution to our vertical lateral elements is dependent upon tributary mass, not the stiffness of those elements. And we have wood shear walls, 14 foot tall structure. And we know the dead load of the roof is 20 PSF and the dead load of the walls are 16 PSF. Uh, how I dived into this first is understood that, all right, they're looking for a, uh, a lateral force, a story force at uh, grid line B. In order to get that, we know that uh, seismic force is a derivation of seismic mass or the weight of the structure. So we need to go about calculating that first. To speed things up, you can look at the figure and say, well, what mass of the structure do we need to account for? We don't necessarily need to always find the entirety of the mass of the structure when we're looking for a specific component in seismic design. We know that this is a line of support, B is a line of support, C is a line of support, and D is a line of support. And so we need to know the seismic force or the story force, I'll call it V, tributary to grid line B. And because it's a flexible diaphragm, it's based on tributary mass. It's simply one half the tributary distance to the adjacent uh, vertical lateral element uh, to grid line B on both sides of grid B. That portion of the structure or that mass of the structure is what I need to account for uh, because that is what grid line B is resisting um, in terms of story force. So that is the only mass that I need to calculate. We see that there's a jog there. So there's two different uh, mass zones, if you will. We wanna make it as simple as possible. So if I split up group B here, I'll go green and I'll say, uh, what I like to do for myself is say, all right, you have zone one or mass one, and then you have mass two. And I'm gonna solve for both of those now. We will call mass one W1 and mass two W2, or the weight of that portion of structure and the weight of the other portion of the structure. Well, W1 is going to be equal to the weight of the roof, which we have one roof section, plus the weight of the walls. And we have two wall lines because we have this perpendicular wall and this perpendicular wall. Now, the weight of the roof is going to be equal to uh, the self weight of the roof, so the 20 PSF, times just in the direction that we are analyzing the, the depth of roof, 20 PSF times 10 feet, which equals 200 PLF. I'm going to leave everything in PLF um, and leave it as basically a one foot strip analysis and you'll see why. If you want to sum all of the mass together for a zone and then divide it along the length of the diaphragm later, you can, but it will get you to the same solution. But what about the weight of the walls? Well, if we draw a little cross section right here of our structure and we know that we are 14 feet tall, we know that effective seismic mass is just one half of the story of uh, walls above and below to the story in question that we are analyzing. So for a one story structure, we actually only need to take one half of the wall height, which would be seven feet uh, to distribute that mass up to the roof and then redistribute it through the diaphragm and then to the shear walls. The lower half of those walls just get distributed down to the foundation and get distributed out that way. So for a wall, it's gonna be plus two because we have two walls and then we have 16 PSF. We know we have a, a one foot strip of wall that we're analyzing. So then we only need the height of the wall for that additional dimension, which is seven feet. That's gonna get you 224 PLF for both walls, or you can think about it like 112 PLF for a single wall. So that gets you W1 on a per foot basis equal to 424 PLF. All right, we'll double underline that and we'll use that in a moment. W2, same thing, 
except uh, we have two walls and we have a single roof, except the depth of that roof, if I go blue here, is now 10 feet plus an additional 10 feet. So the depth is 20 feet. So now your uh, linear mass of your roof component is 20 times 20 instead of 20 times 10. That spits out 624 PLF. Now, from here, let's jump over to the ASC E7. We'll go to that simplified section, 12, 14, I believe, and go through the procedures there on how to convert your seismic mass into a story force, and let's solve this thing. So the simplified section of chapter 12 is all the way at the end of the chapter. You have your normal procedures up front, you know, determining your, uh, your procedure, ELF or modal or anything like that, then getting into special characteristics of building types, um, and the normal procedures that way, uh, procedures for your, talking about your superstructure and then talking about foundation criteria. Then after all of that, you have section 1214 where they say, all right, all of that stuff that we just went through in the chapter for a normal design, we have a very simplified boiled down approach for structures that you need to go through a seismic design, but they're located in areas of basically low seismicity. So as long as the building meets certain parameters that are very stringent and make the building very regular and nice to withstand seismic forces, then you're permitted to do this boilerplate kind of design. And you have to go through that criteria. And they give all of this, don't think it's just there, it keeps going, it keeps going. Looks like 12 parameters that you need to check off first to say, yes, I meet all of these things. So yes, I am permitted for my building type uh, to be able to analyze my structure under this simplified method. If you don't meet the criteria, then you're gonna get kicked back into the beginning of chapter 12 and do a normal in-depth seismic design. The problem already stated that we're using the simplified approach today, so you don't have to go through this checklist. You only have six minutes, let's remember that. But know that it is here, and if you encounter this in a real design, you have to go through this process. We're gonna scroll forward. Something to note if you're familiar with uh, my other videos and have been practicing here, they have their own table uh, table 12141 that mimics the one earlier in chapter 12 where you're picking out your vertical lateral system and then you're getting your, your appropriate design criteria for that system. They have their own back here. So don't be thinking you're gonna go use that table and then apply the simplified approach. You use this table specifically. Uh, while we're here, let's just screw it. Let's grab what we need. We know that we have um, bearing wall system and that it is a light framed wood wall sheathed with wood structural panels rated for shear resistance. So number 13, we are eventually going to be needing R, so six and a half. Just keep that in the back of your head, okay? We know E sub H is our, um, if it's defined, is our effect of horizontal seismic forces as defined in section 1214311. So we're looking for that here today. And so it says, well, E sub H is equal to Q sub E, this is the same thing that you should be familiar with. Then it says Q sub E is equal to the effects of horizontal seismic forces from V, so base shear, or FP, which is a component force, as specified in sections 12.14.75 or 12.14.81 and 13.31. Uh, for our example here today, we're gonna grab on to 12.14.81. That lands us here under seismic base shear, and here's the equation we're looking to plug into. W is the seismic mass of your structure or of the portion of structure that you are analyzing. F is something new for us here. That's not uh, something that's found in the earlier portion of this chapter's equations. Uh, SDS, we all know, we all love. And then R is that response modification factor of six and a half that we plucked from the table earlier. So we have that already. We defined or we calculated both of our seismic masses, W1 and W2, just a second ago. So now we're left with finding F and SDS. Well, you scroll a little bit further, and there you go. SDS is defined as this in this section. And so two thirds looks, looks really normal here. F sub A, we all know about, is in table in, in chapter 12, or sorry, chapter 11. And then S sub S is also in chapter 11. But we know here today, S sub S was given to us at 1.6 G. So we just need to find F sub A. And if we read a little bit, it says F sub A is permitted to be taken as 1.0 for rock sites. Remember that we had stiff soil or 1.4 for soil sites. Well, we were given stiff soil that says soil. So 
Do we use 1.4? Well, let's keep going here because I had a little discrepancy against the solution for this problem. So hear me out. Um, or determine in accordance with section 1144. So for the purposes of this section, sites are permitted to be uh, considered to be rock if there's no more. So it gets into some specifics on how to classify if you get rock or not. So don't, don't sweat that. One thing to note at the bottom here, it says in calculating SDS, S sub S shall be in accordance with 1144 but need not be taken larger than 1.5. S sub S was already given to us at 1.6. I Technically, I would say according to this, you could actually, in your design, use an S sub S of 1.5. Today, we are not gonna do that. They didn't do that in the solution, so let's just proceed forward. Hey, welcome in, Charles. Thanks for subscribing. Right in the middle of recording. Let's just use the 1.6 provided to us. Then they give you criteria for this F, not F sub A, just F. F is 1.0 for buildings that are only one story above grade plane. Then 1.1, 1.2, depending on how you go up in number of stories. The response modification factor is found in that table that we already visited. And then W is the effective seismic weight. And we did that. And then it gives additional criteria for effective seismic weight, just like it does uh, earlier on in chapter 12. We don't have any weird uh, conditions or loadings here today. It was really generic, so we don't need to worry about any of these exceptions. We're one story, so F is 1.0. We have everything for SDS except for F sub A. We have the 1.4, but let's also go out and check section 11.4.4. 1144 kicks us here. We all know, we all love it. It's a nice cozy spot in the code that if you've done seismic design, you've, you're really familiar with these pages. SMS is what we'll need in order to get SDS, which is equal to two thirds SMS. S sub S is 1.6 that was given to us. F sub A, if we read further down here, says where site coefficients F sub A and F sub V are defined in a tables 1141 and 1142 respectively. We see that we need a site class, but we're not sure on the site class. We have our S sub S, greater than 1.5. So that leaves us in this category, but hmm, we're a little stuck there because of uh, lacking criteria in the problem. Well, if we read further above, it says where site class D is selected as the default site class per 11.4.3, the value of F sub A shall not be less than 1.2, okay? Where the simplified design procedure of section 1214 is used, the value of F sub A shall be determined in accordance with section 1214.8.1, and the values of FV, uh, SMS, and SM1 need not be determined. So a little bit of a circular kind of ping pong back and forth that happens occasionally, um, but they are technically saying, hey, if you're doing the simplified design procedure, then uh, you can use FA determined in that section, which was 1.4 for soils. However, they do say, if you do site class D as default per 11.4.3, well, what does 11.4.3 say? Talks about your site class. And it says site class shall be classified as A, B, C, D, E, R, F in accordance with chapter 20. Where the soil properties are not known in sufficient detail to determine the site class, site class D subject to the requirements of 1144, which we just did, shall be used, unless the authorities having jurisdiction say it's site, it's site class E or F. If we made the assumption and said, well, soil properties are unknown in sufficient detail, so we're gonna use D default, that would then kick you down into here, site class D, which would get you an F sub A equal to 1.0, lower. However, the provision up here says, whoa, 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 if you took default D, F sub A cannot be less than 1.2. So is it 1.4? Is it 1.2? Is it 1.0? I would argue through that kind of movement through the code, my F sub A would be 1.2. The solution used 1.0. This will get you, if you use a lower F sub A, a uh, lesser force for a final answer, which would be an unconservative design answer um, when I think there's a very clear path in the code that mandates that you have to use this 1.2. Or you could say, hey, I'm just gonna go 
off of this lower half here and say that I'm using the simplified design procedure. So it says in that section, F sub A is 1.4 for soils. I know I have stiff soil, so that's the only criteria it gives me. So I'm going to use that and proceed forward. That would give you an even more conservative uh, solution because your force would be even higher. Huge tangent, I know, but this is the kind of stuff that you wanna know inside and out for the seismic exam. So there you go. It's nothing very detail oriented when it comes to calculations. We're all talking about just a couple of multiplication and division and stuff like that, but it's understanding the code inside and out and how to move between sections that talk to one another. I'm gonna proceed forward and use 1.2. I'm gonna use, take, the, take the middle road, okay? Let me know in the comments down below if you think otherwise or if I'm just freaking all over the place, all right? Cool. That gets us an SDS of 1.2. Eight. Here we have everything summarized from our discussions and take a second pause here if you need to catch up with writing everything down and just kind of digest this. But ultimately we end up with uh, a story force V equal to 0.197 W. So we left it in terms of the seismic mass that you're looking to, uh, to analyze. Now we know we have W1 and W2. Now let's convert that one foot distributed seismic mass into a story force. And that is simply by plugging these into this equation. We'll say V1 is equal to 0.197 W1 and V2 is equal to 0.197 W2. Gets you 83.5 PLF and 123 PLF. Now, if we scroll back up, we need to now know the tributary length um, from vertical lateral element to vertical lateral element from left of grid B, left of grid B, and right of grid B, <laughs> which would be this blue right here. So that is simply one half of 40 and one half of 20. So zone one times 40 feet over two, and zone two times 20 feet over two. That equals 1,670 pounds and 1,230 pounds. We need to add those up together, which gets you a total demand at grid B equal to 2,900 pounds. Ooh, nice and clean. And that I'll say is the solution for today's problem. Let's scroll back up and we'll see that I fat fingered, but the answer is supposed to be C, uh, 2,900 pounds. This is Rich with Team Kesteva. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And I'll catch you next time. Peace.